I'm, I think I'm going to start anyway. Uh, go. Okay. Um, boy, this is the biggest enrollment we've had in technology, globalization, and culture uh, this semester so far. Welcome, non-class students. Uh, a lot of you probably don't know me because I'm with Mark Rectanis, lead the course Technology, Globalization, and Culture. Uh, we're happy to have guests, students, and uh, I'll get right out of the way. I'll do some introductions here and we'll go on to our speaker. On behalf of all of us here, I'm delighted to welcome Newt Gingrich and his wife, Callista. Welcome. Newt Gingrich was elected to Congress in 1978, served the 6th District of Georgia for 20 years. 1995, he was elected Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, where he served until 1999. As Speaker of the House, he was the architect of the Contract with America, leading Republican, the Republican Party to victory in 1994 by capturing the majority in the U.S. House for the first time in 40 years. He has published 14 books, including Contract with America, Winning the Future, a 21st Century Contract with America, Rediscovering God in America, and his most recent publication, Contract with the Earth. He is also author of several works of historical fiction, including Pearl Harbor, a novel of December the 8th. He received his bachelor's degree from Emory University and master's and doctorate in modern European history from Tulane University. He is here to speak to us on the coming revolution in science. Please welcome Newt Gingrich. Thank, thank you. I'm delighted to be back here uh, at Iowa State. I, we had a great visit just now looking at the uh, human computer interface activities here, which are uh, extraordinarily pioneering and I think uh, rival the best work being done anywhere in the world. So it's a, I, I find it very exciting to come back here and to be on campus and uh, to look at what you're doing to develop the science and technology of the next generation. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanna, I'm gonna posit a couple of very big ideas and then just toss it wide open. We have a little bit of handout here for you, but the handout's just sort of to start a conversation because I think with this kind of class and with the various people who come from, off, uh, from outside the class, it'll be more fun to get into a dialogue. So here are my core points, my, my big takeaways. We should be, barring a catastrophic event, we should be at the edge of a renaissance of so much creativity and so much productivity that 30 or 40 years from now, people will look back and wonder how primitive we are. And we have, there are so many different zones in which this is going to happen. Now, now what I want, to, want all of you to think about is the following formula. I believe there will be four to seven times as much new science in the next 25 years as there was in the last 25 years. Uh, 25 years is a reasonable planning horizon if you're talking about an institution or a large system or, or a country. Uh, I, we have two grandchildren, Maggie will be 33 and Robert will be 31 in 25 years. Most of you will be in the middle of your careers. So 25 years is, is, is in a time horizon that's relevant. Now, why will there be four to seven times as much new science? First of all, there are more scientists alive today than in all of previous human history combined. Second, they get better computers and better instrumentation every year. And you can see this if you just walk around the campus and say, how rapid is the evolution of your capabilities? And tell me about what you could do in 1997. And now show me what you can do today. And you see a continuing acceleration of better instruments, better computing, better uh, uh, capabilities. In addition, Scientists today are connected by email and by cell phone and by BlackBerry in such a way that when they have a breakthrough, it leaks very rapidly. It goes around the planet very quickly. And it is much faster than peer-reviewed documents. If you go back and look at the length of time it took in 1859 for the origin of species to go out, and then you look at how rapidly our new idea is going out today, there's a stunning acceleration in the diffusion of innovation. Uh, and then finally, they are connected by licensing and by uh, royalties and by venture capital to the marketplace. So things move from the laboratory to the market very quickly. And the marketplace is connected to China and India as reserve centers of production. So I think we looked at three or four different activities this morning that are potential spin-offs 
commercially, and several of which actually have companies that have spun them off. This is the nature of science in the 21st century. It has one other fascinating characteristic. Uh, three out of every four uh, new ideas, or at a minimum, thank you, I'm not really wealthy in Diet Coke, uh, thank you. Uh, the, uh, this is one of the things that happens when you represent the city of Atlanta in Congress, as you, you learn early on. I used, to, I used to always drink Diet Coke from the can so that when I was on C-SPAN, I'd be advertising a product from back home. <laughs> Those of you who learn to say the words ethanol or you know, pork or corn have a similar Iowa kind of relation, or soybean, you know, friends of mine who walk around chanting soy diesel. I mean, it's a similar kind of experience as saying Coke in Atlanta. Uh, it's, it's part of the local pride. So, so somewhere between 65 and 75 percent of all the new breakthroughs will be outside the United States. Now, I think that's just objectively a reality, which means if you want to keep track of what's going on, you wake up every morning and you scan the entire planet because you don't know whether the breakthrough is going to be in Sri Lanka or in India or in China or in Japan or in Italy uh, or in Brazil or in Argentina. You don't know which scientist is in. I'm, I'm an amateur paleontologist, and if you look at where are the current fossil sites around the world, it is nothing like 30 years ago because they're now worldwide. So you could be looking at fossils in the Sahara, fossils in Argentina, fossils in uh, northeast China, uh, and, and there's, a, there's a dialogue. In fact, I was talking to a woman whose specialty is fossils in, pa in Pakistan, uh, which is a little bit more dangerous right now than uh, some other fossil sites. But the, the, all these things come together, and you suddenly are part of a worldwide web, uh, which is, of course, where WWW really came from. And the, but the worldwide web is a constant pursuit of innovation and new knowledge. Now, part of what that means, if you think about this, if you, if you later on, if you put this up on a, on a blackboard or a whiteboard or whatever we use nowadays, or you put it up on your con computer screen, you run the, some of you can do math well enough, you can probably tell me this while I'm standing here. If you're going to have four to seven times as much new knowledge over the next 25 years, and I used to say four times as much, but I, I gave a talk uh, to the National Academy of Sciences Working Group on Computation and Information, and the chairman came up afterwards and said, four is not big enough. It's got to be at least seven. So I went to one of my favorite places, the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, and I asked Michael Novacek, who's the chief scientist. Uh, he thought it would be 10, but he's a vertebrate paleontologist, and that's a lagging indicator because we don't invest enough, so they don't get enough new instrumentation. On the other hand, we recently had Daniel Ballin working with us, who was a PhD in uh, microbiology from uh, Berkeley and a uh, brand new graduate last year, and he believes looking at the flow of articles and reviews, that in biology, the number will be 15. So somewhere between four and seven is, a, I think, a reasonable zone. Here's the question for you. You graduate, you get a PhD. You are supposedly at the peak of your profession. You are educated. What is the decay rate of your knowledge base if it's four times as much new science and what is the decay rate if it's seven? If you're a medical doctor and you learned the state of the art in 2007, at what rate will new medical knowledge and new instrumentation, the things we're doing here isn't necessarily new medical knowledge, but it's new capabilities, new procedures, new techniques. In order for you to remain current, what does your learning rate have to be? Now, nobody on the planet today does this. There, there, to the best of my knowledge, there is no institution on the planet which has a scanning and assimilating capability that can keep up with the flow of new knowledge. And I, I'm the longest serving teacher in the senior military. I raise this question in the Pentagon all the time. Because we don't, we don't have it in health, we don't have it in basic science, we don't have it in education, we don't have it in national security. Which means that literally, if you think of it, the ba our knowledge base is decaying every morning because the total volume of potential knowledge is accelerating at a rate faster than we're able to identify and assimilate it. Now, that's a challenge, but it's also really exciting. I mean, it, me it means literally in your lifetime, the number of things you're going to be able to do. And, you're, and you can see this already if you just look at the kind of computer capabilities you have today and go back and look at computation in, say, 1990. 